Long form works great. Vlogging works great. You look at Mr. Beast, you look at all these. But if you're starting, I feel like when you're starting, you don't have the skills yet. So I used to say with TikTok, because TikTok only used to be 15 seconds and they broadened it to 30 and they kept broadening it. Even when they started broadening it in the early days, I'm like, focus on getting 15 seconds, right? Because if you can make a compelling message in 15 seconds, that means your hook has to be fast. Your hook has to be compelling. You can't have any fluff. And once you master short form, you get better and better at whatever. But look, it really depends on the strategy. Like with vloggers, you might do like a full vlog and then you cut it up into snippets. Welcome to the Inbound Buds podcast, episode 140. My name is Tony Cow, and I'm joined by Moby Sadiq. How's it going, Mobs? Good, Tony. Good, man. What's been, what's been happening? Man, it's freezing in Sydney, so I don't know where you are, but if you're in Sydney, you are enjoying the cold like us. Um, but Tony, like, tell me, man, like, I'm curious about, because uh, you're a big foodie, right? Like, you're always sharing, like, foodie vloggers and whatnot with me. Like, dude, why don't you get into it? Like, you always have a camera, but I never see any food vlogs go up. Yeah, like, I have a bit of content, but I'm a little bit nervous and shy, maybe. Like, um, I have all this, like, content in my hard drive, but I just don't upload it. And I can't think of a name. But you came up with something very interesting the other day when we were talking about, um, you know, uh, Mark Wien's, um show. So... Yeah, yeah. I was like, Tony Eats, right? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, it's got a, it's got a ring to it. Because we always do Tony's time and, you know, like, so that's interesting. I don't know. So, you know, the thing about content, though, is like, you really have to love it. Like, so I actually don't think it's too, like, for example, if you wanted to start a food vlogging vlog, mm. right? A food vlog, I guess. You could do it, but you really have to love it. And I think, I don't know if it's the secret, Tony, but it's definitely the key. Because like, I remember when I started Inbound Buzz, I'm like, look, I don't care if anyone listens. Mm. For me, it's an excuse to learn and share my learnings because I'm not going to come on a show without researching. Mm. So I was just like loving that journey. And because I was enjoying those experiences for myself, people did too. Mm. So I think the same thing with you, Tony. I reckon, I reckon you could do it, but bro, you got to love it, man. Yeah. You got to really love food and sharing food because it could be... Three, it won't be three months. It could be six months, nine months, a year, two years. Yeah. But eventually, that quantity breeds that quality and you get good at it. Is, is that what happened to you um, with inbounds when you first started? Like, when, when was it again? Sorry. Uh, 2016. Like, did it religiously or 2016, 2017? Religiously for a couple of years. Was that here or was that in your at home? No, that was at home, man. Oh, wow. I was a, like, I think I was work, started the business like two days, three days a week. Yeah. And, and I, I literally did it on my iPhone. And what was the vision like? Like, what were you thinking of? Or To be honest, I probably could have thought even more about it. But for me, I kept it really simple. I'm like, I just want to learn. I just want to... Um, and I told myself, because there's that fear that no one will listen. So I'm like, let me just vanguard that out of my head. I don't give a shit if no one listens. Who cares? So the expectation was not low, but it was like, I'm going to give good quality, but who cares? Yeah, it was like... It, that's the point, right, Tony? Like it can't just be, and that's why it's so hard for big businesses to invest in content because for them, they need to see an ROI. Hmm. You know, they need to see, and I think with content, you do see an ROI. Absolutely you do. But the bigger you are, the harder it is for brands to justify it because like, well, we can't spend six months with doing all this. And for them, big brands too, Tony, they're perfectionists. It has to be the best this, the best quality, the best. We have to pay for this and that and that. And then the investment becomes so high. Mm. They have to bridge that investment for it to be worth. So it's just an uphill battle. Interesting. But um, yeah, I think it has to be like for me, it's easy for a solopreneur. Hey, I just want to do it to learn. But if you're a business or a brand, you have to realize that's why we always say never create a piece of content unless you have uh, like a decent piece of content, unless you have three, four outlets and channels before you create it. Because otherwise you're, you're never going to be happy. Yeah, interesting. Let me just ask one more question, sorry, because this is interesting for me. Because you were saying like about passion and you were like in Bali making episodes as well. Right? Is that true or is it? Yeah, so for me, I always sort of say like you need to do less and do it well. The big thing in marketing, oh, I need to vlog and write and do this and do this. And like, no, just do one thing really well and call it your come hell or high water thing. So for me, I was, you know, startup, solopreneur, Again, when I started the business, it was two, three days a week. I couldn't even do it full time. I'm like, all right, I know I need content because like content is one of the only ways to grow a business. We've spoken about this on other shows. Like there's only like three ways to grow a business and content's one of them. So I couldn't, and with content, it needs to be sustainable. Mm. Like it has to be replicatable and repeatable. So if you can't do that, then don't try. It's going to be too hard. 
So for me, I'm like, come hell or high water, mm. I'm going to do a podcast. Even when I was in Bali with my wife and she was sleeping, the only place that had good acoustics was an outdoor bathtub with the bushes and the scrubbery and everything. And yeah. And it was like dogs barking, Snakes. the spiders. <laughs> I was scared, but I didn't, man. Wow. So and I'm not saying people should do that, but I'm just saying you need to be committed to your yeah. come hell or high water. Okay, because, you know, because it was like marketing and let's say if I want to do food, right? And like, um, you know, there's a lot of food choice. Do I carve myself out like differentiation? And we'll probably talk about this yeah. later. Or is it like, do I just go with what's like? Great question, man. Great question. So the later you start anything, the more niche you have to do something. So for example, you know, if you started podcasting 10 years ago, you could do podcast for marketing and that's niche enough. Then maybe a few years go by, you're like, no, podcast for uh software as a service marketing right and a few more years go by no no podcast for go to market software as a service businesses so you have to go like niche 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 niche. like so now you might do like okay it's a digital marketing podcast only for marketers in the education industry who are in australia do you know what i mean so Mm. the later you wait the more niche you have to niche so that's definitely a case with time um, so if you just did a food vlog now, there's like a million food vlog- vlogs yeah. out there. Could you do it? Yeah, of course you can, but your path is going to be a lot longer. Yeah. I'll probably have to be eating balloots or something. Is that correct? <laughs> you could do like, yeah, maybe that's why like, and even, you know, there's some, uh, actually my brother-in-law, he's got uh, a page called, uh, um, halal burger addict or something, right? Yeah. It used to just be burgers. Now it's like everything. And He's, he's a little bit of an influencer. Like they will pay him to go visit places and they give him free food and he does some videos for them. And I think now he's trying to monetize it. Amazing. So he's obviously, he started with the halal market. And that's the thing too. When you niche, you can broaden later. Interesting. You can broaden later. So he did halal only burgers. But now he does like not only halal places, he does almost everything now. Do you know what Interesting. I mean? Interesting. So like strategically dive in deep and get some followers on a niche. And then once you grow, you come wide. Yeah, wow. it's, you have to like platform off of something. Mm. You know what I mean? So like, or it's even with new businesses, whether it's a new business or content, it's very similar, funnily enough, Tony. You niche as much as you can niche. And then once you own that niche, then you can broaden. Man, Facebook is the same thing. Like Facebook was just for Harvard when they had the Facebook, right? Yeah. It was just for dating. And then it was like just for college and whatever. Then it was just for students. Now it's everyone. Yeah, but they didn't start with everyone. If they tried to start with everyone, their value proposition would have been too diluted. But they build economies of scale. They cascade on top of a niche in a segment and they broaden. Oh, I love that. That's a very strategic way of building content. Yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the only real way. So like you right now, you might do... That's why you see like fluid vloggers. There's like... Um, there's like guys, like they have their own niche, right? Like there's this one guy on TikTok is really popular. He he's is is a white guy. He's got this bogan white persona, oh, okay. and he just swears. Yeah, right. and he's vegan as well. So he's like, we're gonna make an effing bolognese, effing this, effing that, and like yeah. he just throws shit. But it's like compelling. You see, like it's different, and he actually does good food. Interesting. But his whole niche is like, I'm gonna be a white bogan, and I'm gonna like be a v- vegan. white bogan vegan. And that's right? weird, right? Swearing white bogan. Like, how niche is that? Yeah. So he used his personality for a niche. So you could use your personality. You could be the jiu-jitsu chef. Ooh. Right? Where you review places. I don't know. Jiu-jitsu people actually are all sizes. Actually, there's a lot of overweight jiu-jitsu people. Yeah. So I don't really know. If, <laughs> like <laughs> They just eat everything. So yeah. I don't know if you have a niche there. But you get my drift. You find something. So let's say I do create this, uh, Tony Eats uh, by Moby University you know, with that name. Would I just start on YouTube or do I start creating snippets and I just, you know, like, repurpose it onto yeah that's a very subjective question uh i feel like you're getting free consulting from me on this oh, show yeah. <laughs> i'm playing this is, we, we we talk about this stuff all the time when tony and i catch up no but like it, it's i always sort of say so when i started on tiktok i used to say you need to master shorter form first this is my subjective opinion by the way long form works great vlogging works great you look at mr beast you look at all these you know vloggers who have really long things but if you're starting i feel like when you're starting, you don't have the skills yet. Mm. So I used to say with TikTok, because TikTok only used to be 15 seconds and they broadened it to 30 and they kept broadening it. I, even when they started broadening it in the early days, I'm like, focus on getting 15 seconds, right? Because if you can make a compelling message in 15 seconds, that means your hook has to be fast. Your hook has to be compelling. Mm. You can't have any fluff. And once you master short form, you get better and better at whatever. But look, it really depends on the strategy. Like 
with vloggers, you might do like a full vlog and then you cut it up into snippets. But yeah. Interesting. Man, I love this. This is all gold nuggets, huh? <laughs> man, you better like, man, we just spent like, like 10 minutes on that. You better do something now, bro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that was our nearly our featured uh, bu- um, buzz section. So we'll move on to news buzz uh, <laughs> to the podcast. <laughs> LinkedIn ads rolling out generative AI, conversation ads, and thought leader ads. So LinkedIn is integrating and adding generative AI into their platform. Just like Google, you know, we tried that on Google where on Google ads, we can type in the headlines. It's Mm. generated for us, description, and it's worked well. So to see LinkedIn doing it is very interesting and I'm very like positive about it. Um, Just the whole platform doing things. And, you know, you write a lot of posts and stuff, right? But I, I don't think you'll maybe use it. Or- no, I mean, this is more for ads. So I think it's something definitely we're going to look for our clients, you know, um, in terms of like using some of that. Mm. But I think, yeah, for me, for my personal brand, like it's LinkedIn is the channel I spent most of the time on. And that's yeah. just organic posting. But yeah. yeah. Would you, if there was an AI, um, you know, platform for content post would you use it or would you prefer your tone of voice because you know you know you don't know how to yeah that's that's tricky i think this is a debate that a lot of people are having now i'm already starting to notice when i'm on linkedin i'm like mm, i could tell that was from ai i could just tell like there's too many emo like especially a person i've been following for a while all of a sudden their style changes they've got so many emojis and they've got like they're, they're trying to follow a template and you can kind of feel it yeah right and i think that's just the thing like um nothing it, it, it ai is garbage in garbage out right so if you have great ideas it's all it is it's an input it's like a funnel where you throw things in. yeah so i think it can really augment what you do but on its own it's rubbish yeah so um yeah sure look i have used ai we've we've shared this on previous episodes where we shared a uh, our chat gpt notion where templates on um using chat gpt to create posts mm. but i feel like i always have to tweak and add my voice that's for sure yeah. So also a few other ones I'll touch on is conversation AI, LinkedIn's allowing us to have ads where it's more conversation based on the message, on the messenger. I find it interesting because a message will pop up to a particular prospect and it will kind of be like chat bot style. Mm. And I personally don't like it. I find it's a bit weird, but like there'll be a message and then there's like two quarter actions, and yes, no. I don't know if that'll work from an ad yeah, perspective. Yeah, so I guess what you're saying, and you educated me on this earlier, it'd be an ad, it almost opens up like a chat bot and then you can have buttons and you click on it. I agree with you, man. I feel like people, man, we're going to do an episode one day on bad LinkedIn outreach because the amount of shit that I get on LinkedIn, <laughs> like I actually got one today and the guy was like selling IT services and it was like the fourth one he sent me. Like, we do this, let's have a coffee. I did a one-to-one Loom video and I looked at his website and I like, I, I normally don't have time for this shit and <laughs> yeah, I actually don't have time for this. busy. <laughs> I went on his website and I did a Loom. I'm like, man, you're, you're, but I gave him help. Your outreach is garbage. I'm like, I'm really sorry, but your outreach is garbage. You need to stop pestering people, do assignment selling, go after an industry at a time, understand the industry's pain points and try to solve those. Nice. I guess I'm mushing a bunch of shit here, but I, what I'm trying to say is like, you have to be conversational. So people like that guy, they are going to use this thing for just garbage. And that's an opportunity because Tony, like for example, if we were hypothetically, if we were running a conversational LinkedIn ad, we wouldn't be like, oh, do you have 15 minutes to have a conversation about your leads and your marketing? <laughs> Piss off. Like come, who's going to respond to that? It might be like, again, targeting a niche, maybe the education market, right? Hey, you're an RTO. Did you know that these are the top five uh, lead generation strategies that RTOs are using? Are you using some of these? Click on this for to download the guide and click on this other button if you want to talk to us about it. So you got to provide more value as opposed yeah, to... Yeah, I mean, that's not perfect, but you get my point. Yeah. yeah, it's providing value. Interesting. Well, it just shows that LinkedIn starting to grow their uh, network and their platforms and their ads. So it's interesting in the next few years to see where it's going. Uh, two... Research shows that the majority of marketing professionals are using generative AI. So a LinkedIn poll was conducted, um, you know, and a lot of people is utilizing um, generative, you know, AI or all sorts of AI in their marketing, you know, businesses and stuff. So I think the point is, if you don't jump onto this now, the boat's going to sail and you're going to be left behind, right? Yeah. You have to incorporate into your business. Absolutely. This one's interesting. Many young people want to get off social media. This is what's stopping them. 
So a survey was conducted to 3,000 people and a lot of people cannot get off social media because they felt pressure, you know, like they might be left behind from the cultural awareness, news, mm. whatever. The pressure's on. Every time they go on social media, they don't feel good about themselves. It's like, you know, everything's better. Everything is so much nicer on social media. So that's interesting from a parent perspective or becoming a parent. And also, I think from like a marketing perspective, because I'm like, man, get on social media so we can advertise more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's like yeah. one thing. Yeah, we've got conflicting as marketers. It's so, such a conflicting viewpoint. Uh, but you're right, man. Like, it's funny. Like, I've been off Instagram for like three, four months. Awesome. And then I went on Instagram and I had like 20, 30 messages. Damn. And I immediately felt FOMO. I'm like, oh my God, like look at all these things people have sent me over the last three, four, five months, whatever it was. And then like I noticed myself going back on it again. Yeah. And I deleted it for a reason because it's such a waste of time. But yeah, there's no answer to that. I Like really, I, I try to create more than I consume, but that doesn't always happen. It's funny because I went off it too because it was too distracting. And I went back on it recently and I saw a message from you about a jujitsu, like, you know, event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, oh man, lucky I went on because I would have missed this. Yeah, it's, look, I think, look, as marketers, it's, well, there's a FOMO thing. But as marketers, we need to realize, you know, I was speaking to a client uh, yesterday and he's like, you know, I was talking to him about the importance of doing um, uh, content, writing articles. Like it's not sexy, but that's what you need to focus on. Mm. That's where you're going to get your SEO from. That's where you're going to get your leads from. And he's like, I want to focus on sexy. You know, anyone can write an article. I want to focus on videos. Now, I understand his point. I get that. But like, where are you going to put those videos? You need to house those videos on your website. If you're creating them for social media, man, every five years, the the shift changes when it comes to social media. It mm. changes, right? Facebook was the biggest thing. Now it's not. TikTok is pretty much up there, but YouTube is kind of catching up. So you can't have you can't focus on rented land because there could be a movement where gen, generation whatever they're called now Zeds or whatever like mm. you know stuff social media. We're gonna we're gonna quit social media for like six months, whatever. Yeah, interesting. There yeah. could be like a, a dry July thing for social media. <laughs> so you have got to focus on. It's a good reminder to focus on owned media because social is a very temporary uh, rented land space. Yeah, interesting. So yeah, it's, it's just. The power of social media now in the stream in the past uh, decade. I'll be worried once I have you know, my child <laughs> when things come. But yeah, so that wraps it up for our news buzz. Moving on, feature insight. How to achieve a strategic advantage. And this is very interesting because it's kind of relates to our YouTube podcast content mm -hmm. early on. This is like basic stuff, right? This isn't the sexy AI stuff that we talk about because really what we find in business and sometimes people will come to us for something sexy that they want to do. It's normally, you know, the passing tackling, the basics, man, the basics, right? So uh, if you remember Porter's, like Porter's five forces from uni or from business studies or whatever, that 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 guy, like he's, he had Porter's five forces, like the five forces for market entry. And he's like a marketing legend guru. He's got this model. It's actually, called, it's really boring. It's called Porter's Generic Strategies, right? It's like the worst name, right? But essentially Porter's Generic Strategies for anyone who hasn't seen it before is the four categories or four areas where you can achieve a competitive advantage, yeah. right? This is, these are four ways where, the only four ways, uh, or well, the main four ways, I guess, to achieve a competitive advantage. And I thought this is really interesting. So in summary, like there's four areas and I'm going to share my screen in a second but they focus around cost leadership and differentiation, all right? And I think like right now, everyone is feeling inflation. Like I was saying to you, Tony, before I used to go to like, I went to Subway, bought a six inch sub and a drink and it cost me $14. Damn. I'm like, what the hell? Tasha's looking at, me, looking at me in a weird way. It's like, why you go to Subway? I went to Macca's with my son the other day, normally like, you know, two people, 15 bucks. It was like 30 bucks. I'm Damn. like, and my son doesn't eat anything. <laughs> like, what is going on? So like everyone's feeling it. Everyone's understanding. Now, I know there's that theory that people are just increasing prices because they can and they're blame blaming inflation. I'm sure there's that. But in an era of hyperinflation, there, there are, there's only really one way to grow. So going back to, and I'm jumping around, I know, but going back to Porter's generic strategies, he talks about you can use cost leadership or you can use differentiation. 
So cost leadership is when you know what you seek to become the lowest producer in a category or an industry. So what you do is your cost basis is based on strategic alliances, the technology you use, uh, cheap outsourced labor. You know you have to have a cost advantage to offer a cost differentiation strategy. Cost leadership strategy, rather. Differentiation is when you seek to become unique in a segment. You seem to you want to find an industry or a segment, give them unique value at a higher offering, and you get rewarded for a higher price, mm. right? So an example might be like um, you know when it comes to cost leadership, like Costco or Walmart. Walmart, yeah. Right. Now the thing is, when you look and you can you can pursue that strategy. Right, so I guess what I'm trying to say is like to be the best in class and the best prices isn't a good strategy in this era of hyperinflation. I feel like it's a downward spiral, right? It is because right now to have a cost structure, it's so hard to keep up with inflation right now. Like wages, cost of goods, inputs, cost of technology, everything's going up. So even if you pursue a cost you know, a leadership strategy now, it's very hard to maintain. Hmm. That's one. Second, you're a commodity. So no one gives a shit. There's no brand loyalty to you. And when you look at brands like Walmart and Costco, all the like uh, controversy, they, controversy they've had, all the times they've been in trouble in the media or any scandal they've had, has always been related to costs. Either they're paying their people too low mm. or they're trying to undercut suppliers or you know, like there's some, there's some failing based on a low cost strategy that they're pursuing. Mm. So that leads... That- Cutting costs leads to lower quality, right? It's yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And it's it's just not this. Is the other thing too. So like, I'm sharing my screen now, and if you guys want to, you can listen along. But if you want to watch the video version, it's redpandas.com.au forward slash ep140. But there's like a model in Porter's generic forces, right? So on the I guess on the x axis, you've got low cost on one side and differentiation on the other. On the y-axis, you've got total market and niche market. And really, it boils down to four areas. You've got cost leadership, differentiation, cost focus, and differentiation focus. Now, what it is, is the difference between differentiation focus and differentiation is like differentiation is targeting, say that 10 times, differentiation. differentiation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Differentiation is targeting the total market, right? Whereas differentiation focus <laughs> is targeting a niche smaller market. That's, what, that, that's the differences. Yeah. Now, when you look at it this way, you you are just not able to pursue a strategy in hyperinflation, cost leadership. You just can't. Mm. It's just too hard. You're going to lose staff because they're just going to go for higher paid jobs. Your um, your cost of goods, cost of technology, all those things are going to go up. So it's not viable. In an era where hyperinflation exists, the best strategy to have is differentiation to have a high quality, high value, high priced item, right? So whether you're going, and this is where the differentiation focus versus differentiation is, either you pursue a differentiation strategy, but I'm going to sleep good tonight, (laughs) or you have a particular segment where for that particular segment, you're going to have a high value, high offer, high ticket item. It might even be high touch. It might require more people, but that doesn't matter. Like as long as that premium is inbuilt. That's where branding comes in, where PR comes in, where good content comes in. Mm. So, yeah, and it, this is more kind of boring, you know, hopefully not boring for others because I find strategy very interesting. Yeah, Blocking, tackling, passing type stuff. But these are the things that businesses structurally need to think about mm. if they want to survive this inflation period that we're going through right now. I like that because like when you say value and all that stuff, you can determine your price. Whereas that cost model, you're kind of like determined by the market, right? It's yeah. like he's one dollar, well, you better go ninety cents. He goes eighty cents, and you don't determine that; you lose controls. And- yeah, in differentiation, you're rewarded for your uniqueness with a premium price. It's still tied to a need, but it's like you know when iPhones came out, they were priced very, very high. Mm. Uh, these VR headsets that they've coming out coming out with, they're priced very, very high. Mm. They're well, a business like that is well built for inflation and rising costs because the differentiation factor gives them a huge buffer, a huge padding of profit where they don't get sucked into um, inflation pressures. Because you're already seeing it, like building companies are going down. A lot of building companies are losing business. They're going out of business. You'll see more businesses that will let off more people this year, more businesses that will go under. And I would hazard a guess a lot of them are going to be based on cost leadership strategies 
trying to be the lowest cost, lowest provider, trying to undercut everyone. They're not going to survive. Yeah, that's funny. And specifically in these businesses, like marketing is the first to go, right? And this is the biggest mistake, right? Like we're like yeah. the highest value in the department. Let's be honest here, people. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Marketing, we talk about this all the time at Red Pandas and on, on, on the shows. Uh, you know, marketing is a profit center. It's not a cost center. Yeah. So the moment you see it as a cost center, you're going to try to cut those things and you're not going to, you're right, Tony, you're not going to be, how do you build a differentiation strategy? How do you build your value mm. proposition? You have to market that. You have to communicate that. Don't tell people, show people. Mm. You know, they say, don't tell me, show me type of things, but you're spot on. But that, you know, they're table stakes. Fantastic. Love that. All business strategies today. Yeah. And that, that wraps it up, right? For the Inbound Bud Pod. I'm having a Tuesday. Man, I know. It's a Friday <laughs> afternoons. But no, you're right, Tony. I, I, I can help you out there. But that's it. That's all for today. And uh, if you want to check us out, Inbound Buds Podcast 140 um, EP. So redpandas.com.au Red Pandas. yep. forward slash EP 140. See ya. <laughs> See you guys next time. Thanks for listening to Inbound Buzz. Learn anything? Return the favor by spreading the word. Want to make your mark in digital? Need help with your digital strategy, inbound, and marketing automation efforts? Then visit redpandas.com.au and be sure to tune in next time for another Inbound Buzz hit.